you would think that the most important number in personal finance is the amount of money that you need to be financially free. That way, you can quit your job and just live off your investments. But I have some news for you. It's not. While that number is definitely important, it is not the most important number to focus on while you're working towards it. I'll show you what number is the most important to focus on and how it can transform how quickly you get to that 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, or whatever dollar amount it is that you need to reach financial independence. When Theodore Roosevelt was 18, going into his sophomore year of college, his father gave him a piece of advice about his future and money. You see, up until this point, Theodore was a very accomplished naturalist since he had been studying animals in his free time for the better part of 14 years. By this age, his collection of birds and skins were in the hundreds, and he knew more than most professionals about things such as bird coloration, courtship, flight, and the sounds that they made. He knew a lot about many different animals, but this boy was absolutely obsessed with birds. His father, Theodore Sr., was an accomplished businessman, so he wasn't very encouraging of this path as a profession, but he was not interested in guiding Theodore away from what he truly wanted to do. Back then, science professions weren't very lucrative, so his father sat him down to give him a piece of advice that he would always remember. He said that if Theodore was not going to earn money, he must even things up by not spending it. His father expressed it like this, you need to keep the fraction constant. And if you're not going to increase the numerator, then you must reduce the denominator. In other words, if Theodore went into a scientific career, he must definitely abandon all thought of the enjoyment that could accompany a money-making career, and he must find his pleasures elsewhere. What it came down to is trade-offs. Theodore had to make trade-offs when it came to where he spent his money. Now, I don't want you to get the idea. I'm implying that you can't spend money on things that you enjoy. You can, and I think that everyone should to a certain extent if they choose. And later in the video, we'll even talk about how to do that without making yourself feel guilty. But figuring out where that line is for you and understanding how it plays into hitting whatever amount of money that you need to be financially independent is very important. Roosevelt's father was basically telling him to pay attention to the most important personal finance number that will move the needle his savings rate. It's a simple math equation where you take your net income after taxes minus the money that you spend on your living expenses, then divide that number by your net income. If your income is $6,000 per month and you spend $5,000 per month, then your savings rate is 16%. Ideally, this leftover money is going to go towards income producing investments like broad-based traditional index funds or ETF index funds like the ones that I've made videos about in the past real estate, or whatever else that you decide. This isn't money that's just left over for you to spend on Cheetos or, I don't know, terrible paintings the neighbor kids were selling door to door that you bought anyways just to support their entrepreneur spirit. This is money that needs to be put to work so that you're able to have more free time to do what you want in the future. I need to address the elephant in the room for a minute. How can your savings rate be more important than investment returns? Because the more money that you have invested, the more dollars you'll receive in returns. If you have $100,000 invested into index funds and I have $50,000 invested into index funds and we both get the same 7% annual return, then you're naturally going to have more dollars than me because you had a bigger nut than I did. Your energy and focus is better served going towards things that you can control, like your savings rate, to get that nut number a lot higher, as opposed to things that are outside of your control, like investment returns. Buy your low cost index funds and move on with your life. I'll show you how much increasing your savings rate can change how quickly you reach financial independence. But before I do that, we need to talk about the two factors that go into your savings rate, your income and how much you spend. If you want to help support my beautiful dog Molly in her pursuit to become the best hiker in the world and this channel as well, then hit that thumbs up button, subscribe, and tap that notification bell. If someone makes $60,000 and spends $60,000, then one thing we know for sure is that they're never going to be financially independent before the normal age of 67 because their savings rate is 0%. I would go as far as saying that a savings rate of 20% or less is unacceptable if you wanna have any chance of reaching FI at a reasonable age, which means that we first need to focus on the expense side of the equation because the less that you need to live on, the less that you need to have set aside to be financially independent. Just to give you some numbers to understand the power of cutting even just a little bit from your expenses, 
$100 a month cut from your expenses would equate to $40,000 less that you'll need set aside to withdraw from to be financially independent. I respect the people who like to take the super frugal path to this whole thing, but I personally have no interest in promoting frugality to the point of telling you that you need to cut all of your expenses down to the bare minimum. Once again, that's just my opinion. Do what you want. I'm pro spending money, even above average money, on the things that you enjoy and especially on things that will improve your life. But we do have to recognize that spending above average money on everything isn't sustainable if you're trying to become financially independent. This is why I promote the idea of spending money on a few things that improve your life, then cutting out all of the other BS that you think improves your life, but actually doesn't. It's not an easy thing to do at first because let's be honest, if it were easy to do, then everyone would have a high savings rate and everyone would be FI before the age of 67. For me, I'll spend out the butt on health related products and services because that is extremely important to me. Mental health stuff like like meditation apps and other things that I can't talk about on this channel, but I can on my podcast, which I'll have linked up down in the description. I have no issue spending on high quality food and I'm about to drop a couple thousand dollars on some tests just to review my overall health. But the reason I can do that while keeping a high savings rate is because I cut back on other things that just aren't important to me. I don't have a super nice car, even though I could have afforded one that's at least three times the amount that I spent. I don't have a big expensive house, even though I could have afforded one that was three or four times the price I paid. And this is the case with many other expenses in my life. Being able to cut back a little bit on the big three are where you're going to see the biggest improvement in savings rate. I'm not here to try to preach to you about how you need to cut this and that from your expenses because I'm not you and you're not me, so we value everything completely differently. If you're not sure how to figure out which expenses need to be cut, then just write them down and rank them. Start at the bottom and then work your way up to completely remove or drastically reduce items that you see fit. Ideally, you want your spending to align with your values. The Stoic philosopher Seneca phrased it like this. You ask what is the proper limit to a person's wealth? First, having what is essential, and second, having what is enough. The key part of that is getting the target to stop moving enough so that you can determine what is your definition of enough. Once again, I'm not your daddy because that's creepy, and you're an adult, so you figure out those details for yourself. But one of the biggest realizations that I came to when hitting a personal savings rate of 83% is that you can only save so much money by cutting expenses. At some point, your quality of life is going to suffer, which is what you want to avoid and why I think extreme frugality doesn't work over long periods of time. It reminds me of the old Japanese saying, when you have won a victory, tighten the strings of your helmet. Don't continue pushing frugality to more and more extreme levels after you find a comfortable spot for yourself because it'll end up having the opposite effect and leave you leading a very miserable life on your way to FI. Too much force creates a sort of counter reaction. To hit the higher levels of savings rates, you'll need to put a lot of focus on increasing your income. If you take home $100,000 per year and you found that the sweet spot of spending for you is $70,000, then your savings rate is 30%. Pretty darn good in my opinion, but we can always do better. If you wanna level that up, then all of your focus needs to be put on making more money. That way you can go from an income of $100,000 to $110,000 so that your savings rate gets bumped up to 36%. I think nowadays making more money is a lot easier than most people are willing to admit. Between getting a promotion at work, bonuses, getting a new job that pays more, or doing some sort of side hustle, there's a lot more avenues than what someone like Theodore Roosevelt had available to him back then. If that boy was around today, then he would for sure be the Mr. Beast of bird-related YouTube channels. The more difficult part is the behavioral side of things, not allowing your spending to increase at the same rate as your income. One of the best savings rate hacks that I found that helps fight against this is never getting a raise from work. Now, I promise, I'm not going crazy, so let me explain. I went at least six years without getting a raise at work. Now, technically, on paper, I got many raises and bonuses, 
but in my head and in my lifestyle, I did not get a raise. My overall net worth got a raise because every time that my salary would increase, I automatically increased the amount of money that I was investing by that same exact amount. Lifestyle creep beyond a reasonable level was basically impossible because I completely forgot about it. I think this is why we see stats like 48% of consumers earning more than $100,000 annually who live paycheck to paycheck. Every time most people make more money, they think that they have to go spend it all. It's why I heard about someone the other day making $250,000 per year with $0 saved and barely getting by in an average cost of living area. It's also why I know a couple that used to combined make $650,000 per year and now they're bankrupt and they can't afford to buy a home. Making more money can be extremely powerful as long as you don't act like a spoiled brat who thinks that they deserve to spend more and more money as their income increases. You work very, very hard for your money, so you deserve to do what you want with it, but you also have a responsibility to not squander it away because you are letting your emotional five-year-old self take over. Always remember that the today you has to take care and look out for the future you. Now it's time to show you the real power behind increasing your savings rate that'll probably resonate with you a lot more. Instead of measuring the result in dollars, we're going to measure it in how many years until you can be financially independent. Just so we're on the same page, here are my conservative assumptions when calculating this number. I'm assuming a 7% annual return on investment and a 3.5% withdrawal rate. Now these numbers are all after taxes and inflation. At a $100,000 income and 30% savings rate, you would be financially independent with the option to retire in 25 and a half years. Increasing your income to $108,000 would bring your savings rate from 30% to 36% and you would be financially independent three years sooner. So that's 22 and a half years. We're going for those big leaps though. So let's say that your significant other got a higher paying job or started making more money from a side hustle. If you were able to bump up your income to $138,000 per year and continue to live on $70,000 per year, then your savings rate would skyrocket to 50%. That would mean your years to financial independence would go from 25 and a half years down to 16. Keep in mind, these numbers are only based on if you increased your income. If you decided to reduce some of your expenses, even by a little bit without destroying your quality of life, of course, then these numbers would change drastically. No matter what though, you should continue to push to make more money every single year. If you aren't, then this is a problem that needs to be fixed as quickly as possible because time is running out. Make sure to hit that thumbs up and subscribe button, then check out the description of this video for additional resources to help you with financial independence, investing, and ways to help support my dog Molly and this channel as well. I'll see you in the next one, friends. Done.